you doing today, sir? I'm very good. How are you? I am doing as well as I can be. Um, how, uh, how, what have you been doing the last number of weeks while you've been sort of trapped at home? I've been writing. I've been writing sort of nonstop, literally, um, on something I, I, I can't tell you about yet, but um, something that's been a real pleasure to, uh, it's great. It's, it's been great to have a focus like that, you know, because it's meant that I've, I've not been bored at all. I've been thoroughly engaged. And what was I was expecting to take me, you know, uh, six months, nine months to write. Um, I've written in sort of six weeks, <laughs> um, which has been fantastic. You know, a lot of people talk about how uh, if only I had a month or two of just like to be decompressed. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad I've heard from a lot of people that say they're writing or they're editing or they're looking, you know, people who were filming and they got shut down, they're using this time to reassess the script, look at the footage, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you kind of make use of the time. I mean, my daughter's homeschooling, so, um, you know, she's off working and and it's perfect. It's kind of, it's conducive. It gives you the, the, the reason to sit down. When you've got other things to do, it's it's harder to, to kind of specify one thing to do. But with this, it's like, focus, focus, focus. It's been great. Uh, completely. Um, uh, what do you think? Have you heard anything is, from anyone about what it's going to take to get people back on set and maybe the safety measures that are going to have to be in place to, to get filming to begin? I don't know. I mean, your guess is as good as mine. I think everybody is just waiting to see what happens. It's difficult. All we can do is speculate and, um, you know, act in accordance with what the situation is presenting to us in terms of the amount of people that uh, are still being infected the it's it's completely uncharted sort of territory so your guess is as good as mine man i mean i guess the only time when things are going to be completely back to normal is when there's a vaccine and people can be insulated against catching it it's more about the people that it can hurt as well as it is about you you know i mean someone may get it and and it's a, a rough couple of weeks but other people get it and it's the end so you know you have to think about the big picture yeah i've been asking a lot of uh, producers and filmmakers about if there'd been any talk about um specifically iceland and new zealand about filming things there which are isolated countries that have been able to control the virus in a much better way than a lot of the other countries yeah, but I, I don't know how they would feel about a, a huge sudden influx of <laughs> of people desperately, you know, sort of charging in. We want to film there, not knowing who perhaps has well, COVID. I was thinking about a quarantine period for like anyone flying yeah. in to make the movie, fourteen days in a hotel, and then everyone's clear, and then bang, you can make your movie. Yeah, here. I guess sure. I guess that's how it would have to work. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, you've been writing, but um, have you binged anything? Anything you want to recommend? Oh, um, yeah, I, I was able to, um, well, I watched the new season of Westworld, uh, which I couldn't binge. And I like that. I like one thing I think uh, a pity about how we consume television these days is that because it's all there to be watched when we want to watch it, we don't get that time to spend with each episode. You know, you, you and that, that's not the show's fault. It's kind of our fault in a way, because with most shows you want to just watch the next one it finishes you're like i'm going to go to the next one because i just want to find out what happens but there's something what i really loved about watchmen which was one of my favorite shows of the last few years was the fact that i had to wait a week to see the next episode and i loved being able to listen to podcasts about it and think about it and and the same with westworld which was great uh in terms of binging i just watched this the third season of ozark on netflix which had the most brilliant ending that season in terms of just, you know, the music and the acting and the moment. Ah, it was fab. Yeah, there's a, there's a few things that you've mentioned that I want to get into. I completely agree about the, the weekly uh, episodes because it allows you to spend the week looking online and reading thoughts and debating. And when yeah. you get everything at once, you don't know what you can say online and no one can talk about it because no one's sure where you're at. Exactly. That's so true. And I, I, I love that, that 
the anticipation, the the allowing it to kind of maybe watch it again, you know, and and allow the the episode to 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 be digested and understood, and and a little bit of speculation, and you know, I, I loved listening to various podcasts about Watchmen because I, I was a huge fan of the comic book, and I loved what Damon Lindelof did. It was such a a, a, a superb, um, you know, carrying on of that. I can't see how Alan Moore wouldn't love it. <laughs> you know, um, he's he's notoriously um, reticent to 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 engage with any kind of interpretation of his work. But um, I was watching that thinking, he, this this he would like, you know. But um, yeah, having that time was great. I literally said to Damon. Um, my biggest compliment to you would be that I think Alan Moore would like this. Yeah, I, t I totally agree. That's what I said. You know, um, I, I, and just to, to, because I think Watchmen is by a mile the best thing of last year and one of the best series I've ever seen. It's mm. so jaw dropping. It doesn't make sense what they did on that series. It's yeah. insane. Yeah, brilliant as well, because it didn't rely on, it didn't actually embrace what had gone before until much later in the season, it set up its own identity first. It didn't hang on kind of like pleasing the fans of the comic by, by immediately mentioning, you know, th familiar things. It, it, it made you wait. And eventually, yeah, you do start seeing things that you recognize, but it, it was, it's the audacity of having that degree of confidence was just superb. I thought it was great. Yeah, the, also the, the first episode is so ridiculously amazing. And then you have that episode, it was either episode five or episode six, with the filmmaking involved, with the storytelling, it was operating on another level that, like, I just couldn't believe what they put on screen. Yeah, yeah, it was superb, really was. I love that. I, I, I also binged, um, well, I, actually, I didn't have to binge it, the, the new Better Call Saul season as well, which I really enjoyed. It's crazy how good that show is. And for people that are watching this right now, you haven't seen Watchmen, you should. Ozark, another great show. I agree. The finale of season three is holy shit. Um, <laughs> it was great. Uh, so I have a few fun questions that I've asked everybody who's, we've been talking to, and I swear we're getting into real subjects soon. Uh, okay. Do you have your first movie or TV show crush? Do I remember it? Um, I think. Well, Carrie Fisher obviously was is is the sort of the benchmark one for me because I was seven when I saw the first Star Wars and, and she was my first kind of movie crush for sure. But I think Jodie Foster in Candleshoe might have slightly predated Carrie. Um, so yeah, that which was a Disney, which I found on the new, uh, you know, the, the, the Disney plus uh, thing. They've got their entire sort of back catalog there. And I found Candleshoe, which is this strange little movie, Jodie Foster, David Niven, um, and I rewatched it, and I and I I got a vicarious sort of uh, uh, f feeling of um, childhood glee <laughs> watching it. Um, <laughs> what TV show would you love to guest star on? Well, I've mentioned it a few times, but surely you know, if Taika and uh, and Favreau decide to bring Dengar into the Mandalorian, then I have some form in the past, having played him in 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 uh, star wars uh, uh battlefront and um and the clone wars um so i'm just saying and i heard they just they just employed katie sackoff to play um a character that uh that wasn't in the movies uh but she played it before in another in a different star wars thing so just saying hashtag completely um i am a little bit disappointed that a lot of the mandalorian season two stuff is starting to get out already um, I yeah. really wish that one of the things that I loved about the first season was the reveal of Baby Yoda, having no idea that was coming. Um, yeah. And it's, it's disappointing when things start coming out early, because I would imagine that they were trying to save Katie as a big surprise for when you, you know, watch the episode. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we, we didn't get The Mandalorian until um, fairly recently. And so, and Baby Yoda, of course, was immediately everywhere. So for anyone in the UK, that, that, that was spoiled very quickly. Um, yeah, which is a shame. I might know the answer to this, but what movie have you seen the most? It's difficult to say, maybe Raising Arizona. Obviously, because I've been watching films like Star Wars and Raiders, the films of my childhood, I've been watching since the 1970s. So they would probably um, 
qualify and without me even trying, you know, I've seen those films so many times. But I think as a grown up, um, possibly raising Arizona, just because it it represents for me so much of of what I believe constitutes comedy filmmaking. You know, just the idea and Edgar for Edgar as well, just a film. Comedy filmmaking isn't just about pointing the camera at funny people. It's about what's behind the camera and how the camera moves. And I think that that film is a, is a, a textbook representation of that process. Um, do you own any movie or TV show props? Um, well, I've got... Oh, boy. That one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, up on the wall of my office. Um, yeah, I've got a whole bunch of stuff. I've got my, my wife bought me a, a stormtrooper uniform for, um, for Christmas, which I jokingly said I really wanted. And then on Christmas day, I put it on and was walking around dressed as a stormtrooper. It, it's still the coolest, uh, costume ever designed. And we have a new puppy and she accidentally bit <laughs> my wife. My wife was trying to pick something up and, and Willow grabbed her. And she, Maureen was like, ah, the, the, the dog's got me. And I, and I literally said, I can't help you. I'm dressed as a stormtrooper. <laughs> you can't get around too much in them. They don't, you realize just how difficult it is to be a stormtrooper. But so I got that somewhere. Uh, that Sean shirt, I would, that couldn't have been the only one. Or were there like multiples of that? Or is that the only one? No, there are, there are a few. Um, Peter Jackson's got one in his little museum in... Um, Wellington and there's one in Seattle in a in a movie museum there um there were I think I had about eight of them and they're 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 in various places but that's that's the one I kept and um, my wife put it in a frame for me uh yeah I'm, and that's definitely uh, um an awesome thing for the office <laughs> um you know something I was wondering uh I was recently talking to people about basically you, you're kind of well known uh, you know, I would imagine if you go to the supermarket, yeah, kind of well known. Um, if you go to the supermarket, people are going to know who you are. I would imagine that this is the one rare time that you could wear a mask and a hat, <laughs> kind of go do anything and be completely left alone. It's true, actually. You do. It does afford you a degree of an, an, anonymity, which is, um, you know, I'd rather not be wearing a mask or not have to wear a mask. It's one of the reasons I, I love s snowboarding is because I can go on holiday and not that being recognized is any way a, a, a drag always. Sometimes um, it, c it can be a little bit disruptive, and, uh, but I always try and make sure that anyone who takes the trouble to come up and say hello, you know, you, 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 you can't be rude to those people. Um, but it can be a little bit, you know, when it, when it happens a lot, for the person it's happening to, it, it's not always convenient. So sure. anything you can do where you have a mask on, you know, is, um, can be handy to avoid those little delays. So um, the reason I'm talking to you today is for your new film, Inheritance. You're probably yes. wondering, was Steve ever gonna bring this up? Um, <laughs> I swear it was coming. Uh, so I am curious, what is the secret to playing someone uh, trapped in a bunker? I went and did a lot of prep for this movie, ended up doing more prep than I intended because it got delayed. Um, we were supposed to go before Christmas and then we ended up shooting it in sort of March. And I'd started to, to drop weights, you know, because I figured I should look physically like I'd been trapped in a bunker for 30 years. And I didn't, I didn't want to do, a, do something really over the top like, um, like Christian Bale did for The Machinist, you know, which was a, a really, really almost sort of distracting level of weight loss, you know. Uh, but I did want to get down to a, a slightly more wiry frame. So I ran like... 10 kilometers every day for, for, for three months and, and really got very, very skinny and wiry. And, and that kind of helped me play the role. It was the most sort of prep I've ever done. Um, I think I saw a photo of you being super thin like that. And I was mm. wondering what the, what it was going to be for because it had to have been a role. Yeah, it was just, you know, and, and as I say, I kind of ended up doing a little bit more than I intended and, um, and got down to being like, I don't know. I'm in 20, 20 kilos less than I am now or something ridiculous. And I, and it was funny because when my trainer posted that picture, um, it, it, it sort of caused all this kerfuffle of people going, Oh, that, you know, Oh, you look sick and Oh, you look great. And <laughs> it was, uh, it was, it was interesting. The response for people that haven't seen the trailer or not familiar. How have you been describing the film to people? It's a tense thriller. 
um, a lot of it is is a sort of two hander between myself and and the brilliant Lily Collins, um, and it's a, she plays a, a a prominent New York uh, lawyer whose father passes away and uh, leaves her um, a strange inheritance, which is a, it's a key to a, a bunker in the garden in which is a secret, and. Um, and so it's all about this kind of strange cat and mouse journey that she has trying to find out who the hell this guy is, what's it all about. And obviously nothing is what it seems and there's a lot going on and uh, it twists and turns. And it, it was a really fun, fun movie to do just because I was playing a character that, the likes of which I'd never really played before, you know, a, a, a very sinister, nasty piece of work possibly, or is he not? You don't know. I, as I was watching it, um, it was a role I've never seen you in, and you were great in it. Um, but I kept on sitting there, like, okay, what? Trying to figure it out. And the movie is slightly ahead. Of, you know what I mean? It was. Yeah, it, yeah, it yeah, kept, yeah. It kept me guessing the entire time. What is it like to read? I'm curious. When you're presented a project like this, are you? Is your manager agent telling you all about the project and then handing you the script, or are you being told the bare minimum and then saying you should read the script? I tend to, yeah, I tend to come at it sort of blind, uh, not knowing anything about it. D Vaughn Stein, the director I'd worked with before, I really like him. He's a great guy. And um, he, he sent it to me and, and sort of said, have a read of this. And, and I read it and I really enjoyed the read. It, the, you know, all the sort of twists and turns and the, the, the surprises were, were a real thrill to read. And I felt like, oh, this is, uh, this is something I'd like to be involved in. And that's the best way to, to read a script in a way is, is to not know anything about it. It's just in the same way that it's the best way to watch a movie. Really, it's a shame there has to be such a thing as trailers, you know, because a lot of movies, particularly like all the Cornetto films, really, I would much rather someone have gone to see them with knowing nothing about them because you wouldn't know Sean is a zombie movie when it starts. You wouldn't know that, that The World's End is a sort of alien body snatcher movie, you know. And, and it's those big twists that they always have to put in the trailer, which the audience then go in knowing all about it. It's, it's a, an unfortunate uh, part of the process. Uh, it's funny you say that. Uh, at Sundance this year, there was a film called Palm Springs that the Lonely Island produced. And yeah. they, came in, they came into our studio to promote the movie. Without, I didn't know anything about it. They would not show, provide a link, show the movie before the world premiere. And, and Andy Samberg, after the interview was over, goes, you're seeing it at the premiere tonight, right? I said, yeah. He goes, good, because this is going to be the only audience that sees it without without like having it ruined for them. And I'm like, what yeah. does this mean? And then I'm not going to say what it's about for the people that still don't know. But as I was watching the movie in the theater, something happens towards the beginning. I'm like, oh, shit. Like, because you had no idea this. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It's the same with the, I remember when the Blair Witch Project came out, the initial viewings of that film were the optimum you know they were the by the time it got to the UK there was a lot of hype about it and you know the the the, the truth of what it was um had sort of come out it was still very enjoyable and you could still watch it with with that that's that viewing in mind but it's the people that saw it first that didn't know whether or not it was real that was the genius moment for, for that for that movie you know and it's hard to preserve that experience for everybody as you mentioned earlier you have a lot of scenes with Lily Collins um, mm. I mean, it, what is it like? Because obviously you must have a certain style of the way you like to work on set. Maybe you like it quiet before filming is about to begin or you like music, but each actor and every person on the crew sort of likes it a little differently. What's it like blending how you like to work with someone like Lily? Maybe are you guys similar? Were you a little different? Well, I met Lily, um, on set, you know, well, when I arrived, uh, in Alabama, we shot the, the, the movie in Birmingham, Alabama, and um, and thankfully we kind of hit it off straight away. We did a bit of rehearsing and um, found we had immediate sort of simpatico, which was which is always a relief. You know, it's 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 a worry sometimes. You think, what if I not? What 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 if I don't have chemistry with this person? But Lily and I just really had exactly the same approach, which was. Um, a big help, you know. I, I I really really loved working with Lily. She's great. She totally totally uh, commits to it. She's the kind of actor who will give you the same performance 
off camera as she does on camera, you know, when she does her reverses, there's no kind of, I can relax now a bit because it's not on me. She's still giving everything and that's just the best you can ask for. So yeah, it was, it was fortunate because we worked fast and quick. It wasn't, it wasn't a hugely long shoot. We did all our scenes in that one set apart from, you know, the few scenes we had above ground and uh, we, we hit the ground running, which um, was, was very fortunate. Um, yeah, I, I, I would obviously love to do more details into the film, except I will just say for the people watching, you should rent it, however you're going to get it, and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, and there we'll, we'll not see everything coming. I'll just say it like that. Yeah. I want to jump into, if you don't mind, a few other things. A lot of people wanted to know, what's the status of your Star Trek? Star Trek, I don't know. I, I, honestly, I don't know. Um, you, it's... Um, it may or may not happen. It's not like I get updates. It's just I haven't heard anything for a long time. The last time I spoke about it, um, you know, there were there were there were no immediate plans. Um, I, I one thing I, I I did mention in when I spoke about it recently is that for for us losing Anton Yelchin the way we did was a real blow, and I think it slightly took the wind out of our sails in terms of our enthusiasm to to do another one just because we're now missing one of our family, you know, and it, it, it would be, he would be conspicuous by his absence, you know? And, um, I think in some respects that's, we're all still in contact. You know, we, we were emailing with each other the other day, just saying, <clears throat> checking in, how are we and stuff. Um, but it's not like any, any of us have been banging on the door at Paramount saying, Hey, when are we doing this? You know, if they say, um, we'd like to do another movie, I'm sure we'll all jump at the chance. I, I, I miss those guys, you know, and, and, and I love making those films, but um, I just don't know. You know, Noah's, um, Noah Hawley's project was, has been mentioned and maybe that will happen. Um, I don't know anything about that. Uh, so yeah, I'm as, in, I'm as in the dark as everyone else. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the same boat as you guys, who knows? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious with Star Trek, the. The thing that's interesting about Trek right now is you have a lot of series. They just announced the Pike series this morning for CBS All Access. There's a lot going on on the small screen. And that leads to sort of, I guess what I'm wondering is for Star Trek on the big screen, I think there's two ways. You can either do the big budget mega action or has there been ever any talk about doing, I don't want to say a micro budget Star Trek movie, but a much lower budget Star Trek movie that maybe allows for more sci-fi and stuff that isn't a four quadrant movie. So it's sort of like maybe yeah. aiming at the, like the hardcore Trek fans and not making it at such a large budget. Yeah, I think that's, that would be a good idea. You know, uh, of course, you know, Star Trek has its, um, has its appeal and those, that appeal can be converted into numbers, which can, you know, an accountant can figure out and, and um, the fact is, the appeal of Star Trek is slightly more niche than the appeal of, of say, the Marvel movies, which make huge amounts of money and and um, and have this really, really broad appeal, and they do very well. I think Star Trek is a little, just a little bit more niche, so it it, it isn't going to hit those kind of numbers. So yes, the the obvious thing to do would be to create, uh, 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 not go for that massive spectacle, go for something a little bit more restrained in the vein of the original series. Yes, that would be a brilliant thing to do. And I'm sure it probably has been discussed. Um, but who knows? I don't know. It's one of those, it's one of those kind of frustrating <laughs> questions because I, I wish I had more to say about it. I totally agree with you. I think that would be something that you, you get, you specialize a little bit more, you know? Um, it's, it's a weird one. And, and maybe TV is a better place for it now, you know? Now we're dealing with a television has evolved so much it's become something which is very much uh, a, a contemporary a peer of cinema you know it, it, it's simply viewed in a different way and um, but the scope of it uh, it, it isn't a reduced scope anymore you can still do masses of interesting things and it can still look modern and not inexpensive and maybe television is a better is a better format for Star Trek that's where it started you know yeah, I um I would love to see a Star Trek eight episode or ten episode series featuring all of you guys. Um, <laughs> we, I mean, I would love it, uh, and I think that fans would love it. Um, 
I know it's not going to happen because I will. I just doubt it. But man, that would be fucking awesome. Yeah, I'd love to work with those guys again. And you know, obviously, Star Trek um, is very dear to me. And um, you know, so we'll see. We'll see what the future holds. Yeah, do you still send JJ thank you cards for casting you in Mission Impossible? <laughs> I, I I send him strange pictures occasionally. Uh, yeah, no, I, he knows um, he knows how grateful I am for for giving me the opportunity, you know. And um, um, I'm always kind of, and he'll he'll always just poo poo that and say, oh, you know, don't be ridiculous. But it it it, it was a sort of turning point, and um, and Star Trek and Mission, you know, I mean, the, the stuff that the stuff that I've done that I've self-generated, you know, I have that part of my career, my stuff I've done with Edgar and the stuff that I've written. And, and then there's the other bit where I've got to participate in films like, like mission and, and star Trek and, you know, or work with Spielberg or whatever. It's, uh, it's just been, it's been a delight. I'm very, very grateful. I don't take it for granted. Uh, when you signed on to mission, obviously mission three, there's no way of knowing there's going to be a mission four or what's going to happen. But I mean, are you, are you still a little surprised that, holy shit, this franchise is bigger than it's ever been, and it's now the year 2020? I know. I, I, I had no idea. I remember getting an email from JJ before we did Ghost Protocol just saying, hey, what do you think if Benji's an agent? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be fun. And then here I, I, remember I walked into the trailer before we, you know, we had to sort of rearrange things and uh, was talking to Nicholas Holt and... Uh, and I felt like a, an old veteran, you know, I was like four movers in, it was his first one. And I was hearing about him getting certain training regimes and like, well, how come I don't get it? I've been, I've done four of these. And I, what am I, chop liver? Um, but no, it was funny to be the kind of, um, the old hand. I felt like Ving must have felt when I met him on number three, <laughs> you know, and now Ving's seven in, six in, so. Uh what I mean, listen. I know you just did the the podcast recently, and Chris and you guys teased a little bit about Mission Seven and Eight. But I mean, I'll ask yeah. you. I'll ask you, of course, the question of uh, what can you tease about the movies? Has Chris told you like the the full arc of these two movies, or do you sort of just know a little bit? Yeah, I know the full arc. It was very it was very funny actually because he I was up watching something. I think I was probably watching Ozark, and I, the, my phone beeped, and I looked. It was Chris. And he said, "Come on, come, come on this podcast." <laughs> I was, you know, he said, "He said, are you, are you awake and available?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "Oh," and he sent me the Zoom link, and there, it was the hundredth Light the Fuse podcast, and um, and so I gate crashed it, and then Haley Atwell great gate crashed it, and then Lorne Balf gate crashed it. So the guys that run the podcast were um, didn't know what had hit them, but um, but yeah, it's 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 exciting. I mean, what always happens is it's become a tradition now is that. Before production, McEwen takes me out to dinner and he tells me that he basically acts out the entire film. And, and sometimes what he's told me hasn't transpired. It's changed a lot. But with this one, he's, he's got a much clearer idea. And I think the reason we're splitting it into two is because he is, he's really keen to give every character a proper arc, you know, a proper emotional detailed character arc and rather than just try and cram it all into one film um he's going to allow that arc to to spread out over two which is, is a testament to his sort of style of writing no matter how big the um the action gets and how crazy the stunts become at the heart of it is always a story about you know genuine human emotion and i think that's what fundamentalizes his writing the thing about mission impossible is these movies are spectacular and they take so much time to film and i know that each of these is going to be two probably two and a half hours each just probably you know almost five hours of screen time i know what that's going to take filming wise and with the stunts and with everything else so are you i mean is it going to be like a year of filming for you probably i mean you know we, we we've got to shoot one and then i think we have a little hiatus and then we shoot the other so <laughs> It was funny when I met all the, the people that are going to be in the new ones. Um, it was, you know, we had a sort of pre, what was going to be our kickoff dinner. It turned out not to be, obviously. But knowing that these actors were going to become my sort of friends now, because we're going to work together for like nearly two years. And um, 
that's always quite an interesting prospect. It's uh, it's nice to have that kind of job security. <laughs> sure. Um, can, can you tell me, this is a jokey question. Can you tell me what happened in MI3, Ghost Protocol, Rogue Nation, and Fallout? Or is it all a little bit of a blur? <laughs> it is a little bit of a blur. I think, obviously, um, the more I'm in them, the more I remember. Um, but yeah, I probably could. I mean, it would be a it would be a boring, stuttery, long, yeah, long I monologue. Yeah. But I, I think I probably could. You know, it was funny. I watched a film the other night um, called Revenge, and um, they used a location in Morocco that we used in uh, in Rogue Nation, exactly the same living room where I did, where I we lay out this plan for for Ethan getting into the water thing and all that all that stuff, and it was. Um, it was quite interesting to suddenly see that location used again. It's not a great story, but it happened. <laughs> um, every time I've been fortunate enough to talk to Tom Cruise, he's literally the nicest guy in a radius of a hundred miles. It yeah. is, he's unbelievable. Um, what is it like working with him on a daily basis? Cause I'm constantly blown away by what he puts on the screen. And I'm also curious, what is it like when he is doing some of these life you know, these terrifying stunts that are literally putting his life on. It's always fun. You know, he's an incredibly generous sort of performer. He's very, he cares a lot about everybody else. You know, like whenever we're doing stunts, me and Rebecca or whatever, he's always sort of kind of hanging around the monitor and, and, and worrying whether or not we're going to get, you know, after hanging off an airplane and he's sort of like uh, um, suddenly worried about, me having a fist fight and you know something which isn't particularly scary uh he's he's incredibly fun to be around i, I like it because it, there's a normal person there there's a there's a regular person that you never that people tend not to see who's also very aware of who he is and what he's become and there's 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 a part of him sometimes which is almost like this <laughs> what's going on you know which is nice it it, it, it makes him more human but um yeah, he, he he's great. I've always had a, a a good experience with Tom. I find him to be, you know, you're working on something which is going to be um, executed with 100% kind of commitment and enthusiasm. And it's nice to have that as the standard, you know, because it makes you up your game. It's great. Uh, does Benji get a mask gag in MI7 or 8? Well, that was one of the great things I thought that McHugh played the long game on in terms of Benji's you know, because in 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 episode four in Rogue in Ghost Nation, uh, Ghost Nation, Ghost Protocol. <laughs> God damn it! Oh dear. Um, in Rogue Protocol, he he's uh, he wants to use a mask, and, and in the end, he can't. In Rogue Nation, there's a hypothetical scene when he's wearing a mask, but he never actually gets to do it. And so there's this kind of running gag of Benji never gets to wear a mask. And then, of course, in 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 um, the last one, Fallout, I wore two. There, I get to, I got to be Wolf Blitzer, which was really fun because um, Wolf was on set and uh, we we had this brilliant fake news gag, which um, I thought was well ahead of its time. And um, and then of course he Benji also um, is disguised as another character. I won't spoil it in case you haven't seen it. So I think that's kind of been done. Um, it was a special thing to do was to that whole thing to do a scene when I get to do this you know, cut and then they do that. That was like, wow, I'm doing a Mission Impossible mask pull. Take that off my bucket list. You, and uh, how much did you pay Chris to put that in the movie? <laughs> I just, I trusted him, you know, because I had a mask gag in Ghost Protocol originally. And Chris came in and he, he rewrote it and changed the scene. And I was kind of a bit disappointed because it was a, a moment that I thought was really cool. And it was, it was a cool Benji moment. And Chris said to me, what do you miss about that moment? You know, cause I was a bit like, Oh really? And I just said, I just, I'd like Benji to do something cool rather than just be the, the, the nerd guy. And, uh, and so Chris wrote the scene where I shoot the character that's fighting with Jeremy Renner. And, and so it became a thing. It was like, so when am I going to wear a mask? And, and we did that thing in rogue nation and it was three films in before we paid it off. And I, I think that's a, a really smart thing to do, you know. He 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 held some stuff back. He's a he's a he's a he's a clever boy. Lily, um, I know we're a little bit long right now. You have just a few more minutes. I have a few yes. other questions. Are you, do you have the time? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm just making sure. 
I don't want to, you know, keep you on the line. Um, <laughs> will we ever get another Tin Tin movie? Oh, I don't know. I mean, that, that's, that's an interesting question. I, there, there was a time when there was definitely going to be a kind of a, a series of them. Um, that seemed, the, 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 the sort of momentum of that has, has abated slightly. So I, I, I honestly don't know. And if, if, if they do, I'm not even sure if, if Nick and I will be involved as the Thompson twins. It is kind of obviously um, with, with performance capture, it doesn't really matter that we've aged so much, but um, uh, yeah, it'd be fun. It'd be nice. Any chance for me to work with Steven Spielberg or, um, or Peter Jackson, I would always be happy to, to do obviously. Yeah. I'm a little disappointed that uh, another one wasn't, hasn't been made. Yeah, I, I love Tintin's a, is a is a lovely film. You know, it's it's really uh, it's got Stevens magic all around it, and um, uh, it's obviously visually stunning. Um, I think perhaps it was, you know, in terms of his brand, the brand recognition, it wasn't like something that um, certainly a lot of Americans kind of like knew and like like he is in Europe, like he is in sort of you know, but um, I think when Steven did Raiders, he was kind of had this idea about a Tintin style character. So his influence is there. So I loved, uh, loved the first season of The Boys. Just yeah. incredible stuff. Um, did you have any idea when you were making it that it was going to blow up? Because I, at the time, I believe it was Amazon's, you know, number one series. It might still be. Yeah, no, I didn't. I, you know, obviously having been Huey since 2008, whenever it first came out, um, whenever the idea was floated of it being turned into a live action show, um, I'd get calls about, oh, are you going to play Huey, this kind of stuff. And I, by the time it did become, there was a whole, there was a script, Adam McKay did a script. Um, and then by the time it became a series, you know, it was way past me playing Huey. And um, I heard Jack Quaid was going to play Huey. I just thought, he's, I haven't got my, I don't have high enough praise for Jack as a person and an actor. I think he's amazing. And um, and then, you know, they got in touch and sort of said, oh, would you do a cameo? Because obviously I had this strong connection with the comic book. And and we came up with the idea of of me playing Huey's father. And and that was it was really more a kind of handing of the baton over and an, an acknowledgement um, of 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 my small connection to the to the comic book. And Eric Kripke was uh, was brilliant to do that. I was it was, it was really fun to do. Yeah, I love the first season. and. Um... I know the second season, I believe you're not involved. In it. No, Huey's father's in witness protection now, obviously, because, you know, he's, he's um, I'm, I'm not saying he'll never come back. He might do, but um, he's safe and, and tucked away somewhere away from the, uh, the horrors of superheroism at the moment. Yeah, I was going to say Amazon's going to pick up this show, I mean, for a foreseeable future. So um, I would imagine that there's always the chance you could be in season three or four. Yeah, I'd love to be. It's uh, it's great, but it's also fun to watch, you know, just as a spectator. Uh, what is going on with Truth Seekers? Oh, that'll be out, you know, um, I guess towards the end of the year, perhaps. I don't have a definite, don't quote me on that. We've just been looking at all the sort of promotional um, material for it. Um, Jim, the director, sent us a little picture from the, from the um, grade yesterday, sort of saying that it's finished. And um, yeah, that'll be out this year so i'm excited for people to see that well for people that aren't familiar with it because obviously it hasn't been at like it's not out there yet can you tell people what it's about and why you're excited uh to for people to see it yeah it's it's a show about um paranormal investigators um it's the first sort of big show that that my, i've produced with nick from our new company stolen picture um <clears throat> we've got a whole bunch of stuff um slated and the thing that i've been writing in uh quarantine is is one of those things but this is a um yeah it's the story of a, a sort of satellite uh engineer who is paired up with a younger um guy and and nick's character nick frost's character he is um a sort of paranormal um aficionado and he has this small youtube channel and as soon as he he teams up with this younger guy, things just start to happen. And so it's basically a kind of, I, I'm not, it's not like a me and Nick show. It's not like myself and Nick in the lead roles. Nick is the lead actor with a, a group of brilliant younger actors as well. I'm in it sort of in a cameo um, a capacity weekly, most weeks. Um, but it's a fun kind of, it's got a really nice, odd um, 
feel to it. It's uh, it's it's funny, but it's also creepy. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to people to seeing it. Nick's fantastic in it, as are the rest of the cast. I would imagine it has to be really cool for the people that worked on the show to have you and Nick in scenes together. Um, Cause I'm sure everyone who works on the show or worked on the show is a fan of Shaun of the Dead, not, you know, and all the movies you guys have made together. So uh, what is it like? Can you feel that everyone is sort of staring at the two of you when you guys are working <laughs> together? I think by the time I came in to do my stuff, they'd already been on it for like weeks and weeks on end. And, um, and so, you know, the, everyone's very professional. And if they were in any way sort of found it novel to see Frost and I in the same scene, they hid it well. Um, I, love, I love working with Nick, obviously. He's my best bud. So any chance we get to, to act together is always um, a real treat. So I think I was probably more excited than anyone else. Uh, America, the motion picture. Billy, this is an animated project. You and Shane. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're yeah like, that's right. I did that too. <laughs> um, I, I think it's scheduled to come out later this year. Uh, what can you say about it? Uh, I'm not sure what I can say, other than I play a, a very fun character. It's it's to say that it's a revisionist take on American history would be a slight understatement. It's just uproariously funny, and um, yeah, it's it's nice to get to do a movie with Channing, even though we didn't actually obviously interact, as as is often the case when you do animation. But uh, yeah, it's very funny, very silly, and uh, quite profane. You're gonna love it. I can see you're in your, obviously the office that you work in that you write. How, can you talk a little bit about, for people that are wanna be writers, can you talk a little bit about your process in terms of, do you find that when you wake up in the morning, you spend a few hours writing and that's like, that's your perfect time? Or are you like a nine to five writer where you can sit there all day and actually write? Oh yeah, I mean, I find with writing is that if it comes, you do it. it you, you kind of aren't in it, you don't really have a say. If you start to have ideas, like the thing that I'm writing at the moment, I'm writing with a friend of mine, and <clears throat> we we tend to use FaceTime, obviously, at the moment. Um, but I'll, I'll walk my dogs at seven in the morning and start kind of like sending him ideas that I've had overnight. And and when, when, when the ideas are flowing, you can do nothing but write. You don't really have a choice. Sometimes when you don't have the ideas, it's hard to sit down and... Um, and just wait for them to come. But this situation, as terrible as it is, um, has certainly focused me um, and enabled me to kind of, I don't know, it's, it's been very conducive towards getting stuff done. I've written um, a lot in the last sort of eight weeks and um, it's stuff that I'm incredibly excited about. I can't wait to tell you about what it is as well. It's frustrating that I can't, but um, yeah, it's, it's writing is just it's not kind of in your control it just it's suddenly oh it's coming it's coming i remember being on a boat in greece and and a whole scene of a whole sequence in paul came into my mind and i had to stop the boat go to a little shop buy a notebook and write it all down because otherwise i'd forget it so yeah do you have like an unproduced script or script or two sitting in the desk that like is you know or is it sort of like you know what I mean? Like, do you have a lot of unproduced stuff or is it pretty much the stuff you've written has made it to the screen? Uh, a couple of things. I've, re I've done rewrites on things that haven't come to fruition. Uh, the thing that I'm working on right now, I've been working on since 2012 and um, in various kind of incarnations. And finally, um, this year, um, managed to sort of get it commissioned. And um, so, yeah, there are always things hanging around that, there's something I, there was something I really wanted to direct, actually, a screenplay I was working on for a long time, did a lot of work on it, and then that ended up not happening. So, um, yeah, that's just part of the job, I guess. How close did you get to uh, directing? And is it something that you will be doing in the future? Undoubtedly. I, I, it's something I really want to do. And I may even, uh, there may be things with Stolen Picture going forward that I, um, that I direct. Um, it's, it's a nice opportunity, actually, to be able to... Um, you know, have a say in that. The, the film was something I was developing with Naira and um, I hope it does get made. It was a really lovely script, um, but it just, what with the specificity of where it needed to be shot and my commitments to mission and other things, it, it ended up just being something that I had to to let go. But I'd already started planning my approach and 
my my ultimate ambition is is to direct is to step back and and actually be behind the camera you know last question for you it's the thing that i got asked the most on twitter skipping all the twitter questions but this one a lot of people in fact most people wanted to know you obviously have such a great collaboration with edgar and nick and you've made such classic films together um are you guys talking about at some point doing another project together? It's all we talk about, really. I mean, and I mean that's not that's not true because you know Edgar and Nick are my friends, and we 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 see each other and talk to each other a lot. But Edgar and I particularly always say, "Oh man, we got to do something. We got to do this. We got to do that." There's no doubt in my mind that we will do something together at some point. It's just a question of when all the the various things that we're doing independently align, and we have that window, we'll do it straight away. And um, I'm, I can't wait, you know, it's been, it's been a long time since the world's end. And, you know, I think because we see each other anyway, we've sort of forgotten. Edgar's obviously been very busy. He's, he's such a sort of prolific, he can't wait for me. I can't wait for him. Nick can't wait for either of us. It's going to have to be a moment when the three of us suddenly, you know, the great conjunction, it all aligns like in the dark crystal, the planets. It's uh, when that happens, it'll happen. Um, I have a million other things we could talk about, but I'm going to say thank you so much for giving me extra time. You're very welcome, buddy. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you. I really hope that uh, your family and you stay safe and healthy. Yeah, you too. I hope everything's uh, good there. Yeah, I'll see you. Well, I'll, I'll, next time I'm in LA, we'll, we'll do this in person.